Shalom, Mom, Shalom, Mom. Call Halal, Yahweh, Bashem, Yahushai. The Bahamas TV, Apostles, and the Elders of the Great Millstone, who well. So I taste your breath on the four corners of the earth, question, word, truth, and sincerity. Uh, today's GMS motivation video is going to be on uh, institutional racism and the, uh, and particularly the uh, educational uh, aspect of institutionalized racism and how, how, and how it affects our people, you know, in the everyday life, especially the youth, um, you know, growing into adulthood and uh, how they're perceiving the society, you know, and count it out, you know. You know, as a subject of uh, institutionalized racism, you know, our people are usually, I mean, everyone's heard it when they're young, you know, um, dead before, or dead or in jail before 21, um, you know, uh, you know, usually doing life in prison, uh, never amount to anything, you know, shit that they say about, you know, niggas coming up in the world, you know, so I'm just going to jump right into it, it says institutionalized racism from Wikipedia, it's institutionalized racism, also known as institutionalized uh, institutionalized racism is a form of racism expressed in the practice of social and political institutions. Institutional racism is also racism by individuals or informal social groups governed by behavioral norms that support racist thinking and foment active racism. It is reflected in disparities regarding wealth, income, criminal justice, employment, housing, health care, political power, and education, among other things. Whether implicitly or explicitly expressed, institutional racism occurs when a certain group is targeted and discriminated against based on race. Institutional racism can go unnoticed as it's not always explicit and can be overlooked. Right? Because institutionalized racism is uh, really racism on the fly, you know? Racism that flies under the radar, you know? Um, they're not going to tell you that they're openly racist, but the actions that they perform, you know, that affect your everyday life, are in fact racist, you know? Let me see, let me go down for a second. I want to go into this affirmative action just really quick. Um, now, as we all know, the affirmative action uh, was a bill that was signed for um, for basically uh, people of color to get into these higher institutions, higher white Ivy League institutions and, you know, of higher learning. But the thing is, uh, President uh, Bush, he actually, when he enacted uh, the affirmative action, he tried to actually pull that out. And what he did was he enacted quotas. So there's only a certain, so you can hire, I mean, it's like you can uh, admit, you know, a black side of Native Americans, but only a certain amount to keep your institution, you know, to keep the, uh, the what do you call it, the image of your institution up, you know, and only hire the ones that, that actually, what do you what do you call it? That um adhere to our image, you know. That's where you get the um, you know, the jakes that don't that don't remember where they come from, the ones that try super hard to to assimilate to the society. You know, those are the ones that we want in our schools, our institutions. You know, not those niggas from the street corner, the niggas from the from the hood. You know, but the niggas that act more like us. It says another impediment. Affirmative action, another impediment to removing barriers to diversity occurred in the 1990s when former President George H.W. Bush attempted to eliminate affirmative action during his term of office. He ordered the use of quotas, see, preferences set aside on the basis of race, sex, religion, or national origin be abolished in hiring. Time, right, so, so those quotas, he wanted to, to destroy those quotas, like, look, Ain't no affirmative action no more. You know, they can hire whoever they want to, and they want to hire white people, they can hire white people. Congress responded with the Civil Rights Bill Act of 1991, which only covered the terms of settling cases where discrimination had previously been confirmed. So even that didn't help, you know. They they filed a, a, a law, you know, a Civil Rights Act, but that only helps when, you know, when you have a previous case. If it's a new case, you're shit out of luck. It had been near impossible to prove a case of institutional discrimination in the courts, and many other cases were terminated upon imposition of consent of a consent decree. So, like uh, like that saying goes, um, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove in court, you know? So you couldn't even prove acts of institutional discrimination, you know? That was what the Civil Rights Act of 1991 was for, and they knew that. 
So it looked like the, the uh, Supreme Court or Congress was helping the African American community, but in in turn, it was actually working with you know the president. It says this fueled the rise of 1996 in California Proposition 209, a ballot initiative abolishing affirmative action at California universities to counteract what conservative critics called saw as reverse racism. So that was the birth of reverse racism, you know, enacting the affirmative action. This is where members of a minority group get preferential treatment over the majority as a remedy for past wrongs, and the voters can be swayed by spacious agreed arguments against this to vote the anti-affirmative action measure into law. This closed down the avenues affirmative action initiatives had opened for blacks to have race counted as a factor when accounting for different rates of acceptance to universities. So all that was being shut down, and consequently to employment, discrimination lawsuits that sought redress from discriminatory hiring. You know, it says this is where the arguments for redress for past wrongs under the catch-up provisions no longer worked in favor of claimants. You know, so they were trying their hardest to get rid of the affirmative action that was created, you know, so it no longer worked in our favor, you know. And so they're doing everything that they can to keep, you know, to keep the blacks and Native Americans uneducated, you know. Now let me go down to uh, this little section in education. It says, in education, standardized testing, like those uh, those statewide tests, tests that you would have, you know, twice a year in a grammar school, has also been considered a form of institutional racism because it is believed to be biased in favor of people from particular socio-cultural backgrounds. Some minorities have consistently tested worse than whites on virtually all standardized tests, even after controlling for socioeconomic status, while others have tested consistently better. The achievement gap between white and black students mirrors the gap between the two groups in a variety of IQ tests, many of which are designed to be culturally neutral. The cause of the achievement gaps between blacks and Hispanic, white, and Asian students have yet to be fully el 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 elucidated, you know, which means uh, to be solved, you know, because they put us in these low-income neighborhoods, and they put us in the ghettos. They put us in these, uh, basically, these ghost towns, you know, where there are no, are virtually no resources for anyone to better themselves. And the cause of that are students who uh, are, you know, our children that lack uh, attention spans, that um, that don't care about, you know, uh, learning and education and, and knowledge, you know, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, you know. They see what they see every day in the neighborhood, which are, which are uh, drug dealers slinging crack, you know, uh, basketball players, football players, um, rappers, you know, singers, you know, they don't see uh, they don't see role models that actually have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding because of the background that they have been placed in, you know, it's called um, it's called social engineering. I want to go to this higher education. Uh, clause real quick it says in the 1960s, students of color started attending colleges and universities in record numbers after the passage passage of the Civil Rights and Higher Education Acts. However, the obstacles of integration in predominantly white institutions of higher education led to unforeseen obstacles for faculty and students of color working and studying in such environments. According to a review of educational research, tension and violence followed. One reason being the lack of preparedness of many colleges and universities to teach a diversity of students. Initially, it was also difficult for many black students to attend college due to the poor quality of education in segregated schools, right? So, it's put us in segregated schools where we have the worst, where we have worse education systems than they have. Um, outdated books, um, outdated technology, you know, so we don't learn at the pace that they learn, you know. And it's all, like I said, it's all by design, it's all social engineering, you know, so the next generation that comes along will uh, be, you know, deliberately dumbed down, you know, while their gen while the, the uh, Edomite generations are being constantly excelled. So that's, that's how they create this so-called achievement gap between blacks, Hispanics, you know, white and Asian students, you know, which are Israelites, uh, Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites, you know. Uh, the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision 
was the beginning of the process of desegregation and the elimination of the jail discrimination. However, it was hard to determine the challenges that the process would present and the obstacles that would continue to this day. Both verbal and physical abuse continued. The increase of racial tension and racial incidents in institutions of higher education is said to be due to the lack of knowledge, experience, and contact with diverse peers. Peer group influence, increased competition and stress, the influence of off-campus groups and media, alcohol use, changing values, fear of diversity, and the perception of unfair treatment. You know, and that goes both ways, you know, because what of what, you know, Esau has been doing to Jake for all these years, they have a, they have a natural resentment towards Esau, you know, and of course Esau has a natural resentment towards Jake, you know, especially since Jake is infiltrating all their uh, institutions that are supposed to be for them, you know, so of course they're going to feel some type of way and there's going to be uh, fighting, you know, there's going to be alcohol use, there's, you know, all these things are going to happen, you know, but the thing is, the thing is that uh, the affirmative action really only made things worse because we're not even supposed to be uh, we're not even supposed to be um, desegregated. We're supposed to be segregated according to the laws of the Most High. You know, so if we were segregated, none of, none of this institutionalized racism and this uh, you know this unfair treatment and affirmative action, all that, all this crap wouldn't even have to be uh, you know be um, be put into realization. You know. Or for lack of for lack of better terms, you know. But the thing is, Esau is in control right now. So even if we were we were segregated, you know, it's very hard to um, create a quality system of education, you know, under the devil who who designs the whole world to keep you know to keep Israel in a state of um, dumbfoundedness, you know. So that's that's really all I wanted to read on the uh, institutionalized racism document. But I do have a, a quick video. Um, it's a video uh, from um, Vice News. And it's about, you know, the students in Detroit. How the institutionalized racism basically is uh, rampant in Detroit. And they're not getting any type of uh, resources and, you know, any type of help uh, with, uh, with education, you know. So I wanted to play this really quick. And it's all by design, you know. The state of uh, Back in the state of um of Michigan is uh what do you call it? Purposely, you know, withholding, you know, withholding uh, educational resources from the uh, the inner city youth in Detroit, which are mostly uh, Jake, man. It's mostly Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, you know, and the rest of the tribes. September, seven Detroit students filed a lawsuit against Governor Rick Snyder and other state education officials. They argue that the state of Michigan is violating students' constitutional rights by depriving them of literacy. Yesterday, the state filed a motion to dismiss the case, claiming that there is no fundamental right to literacy. But the court battle is far from over. A week after the case was filed, Jay Caspi and Kang visited one of the six schools named in the complaint. Hello. You at the bus stop. Right now, I'm waiting on the bus, getting ready to go to school. Gotta get up a little bit earlier than everybody else because I live so far from the school. So, yeah. Osborne Evergreen Academy is a high school on the east side of Detroit. 89% of its students aren't reading at grade level, which is typical for a Detroit public school. Jamari Hall is a senior at Osborne. He's classmates with one of the unnamed plaintiffs in the lawsuit. What's your favorite subject in school? Math. And you took pre-calculus last year, right? Mm -hmm. so what, what math class are you in right now? <laughs> pre-calculus again. Anyway, why, why did that happen? Like, why are you taking the class over again? Really, I don't think it's enough, uh, even another teacher probably available to teach the next math class. And even if it is, it's probably not even no books for that math class. Mark Rosenbaum, one of the lawyers leading the case, says that this is the first time anyone's argued that literacy is a basic right protected by the 14th Amendment. Literacy means the capacity to read, to learn, and to understand. That's the argument here. The 14th Amendment is about equal citizenship, equal access to the institutions of a government, equal opportunity to learn, equal treatment within the schools, which after, after all are the engines of the democracy and the great equalizer. And that's what the argument is here, that, that all children, no matter their race, no matter their class, 
have access to literacy. The suit argues that schools aren't equipped for learning. Problems range from teacher staffing, lack of books, and a rundown unsafe facilities. Like the bathroom, sinks don't work, there's no doors on the bathroom. The classes, it's subs, it's so many subs, different subs every day. Water fountain doesn't work. It's just books, no books. Books all torn up, got to get taped up. The teacher got to put the assignment on the board and everybody got to copy it down just because it's not enough paper to make the copies. The school would be so hot in the summer, so cold in the winter. Why do you think the schools are in this condition? I think people don't care and I think that they think that we don't care. Like that we're all, everybody just on our agreements that it's cool. But it's, it's not like that. It's not like that at all. So yeah, again, so they, so they're suing the students, actually. <coughs> Sorry. <again. coughs> the students are actually um, suing the state of Michigan because they, you know, because they want education, you know. You know, and it, because like you said, the, uh, there are certain facilities in, in the school that don't work. You know, the, uh, the books are old, ripped, torn up. There are no resources, you know. Because look what they are. They're in Detroit, Michigan, which was uh, socially engineered to be a ghost town, you know. And most people that live there are blacks, Latin, and Native American from the start. So, of course, you know, their, their schools are going to um, be in that type of condition. But the schools are in that type of condition so they can go from the school to the prison system, you know. So it can be put back on the stock, you know, back on the stock market, and be traded as slaves, man. You know, this is Romans chapter thirteen, verse ten. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor; therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, and they, you know, and everybody claims, uh, it's it's love for all and love everybody, and, and you know, we're all human beings, man. No, 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 no. Because if we were, if that were so, these things wouldn't be going on, and these things wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be. Um, when they have a strong presence in the Israelite community, man, you know, this is about keeping the black flags of Native Americans and children of Israel at bay, you know, while Esau controls the world, you know, and keeping us from from obtaining the blessing which is the kingdom of heaven. That's what this is all about, you know. You know, so and that's a big reason why they created the social engineering, you know, which is uh, what do you call it? Which is, you know, BET and rap and black culture, you know? And this is, uh, and this is an article from Huffington Post about, you know, like I said, the school to prison um, complex, which is it's called the school to prison pipeline, you know? And this is created in order to keep, you know, the black Native Americans uh, docile and institutionalized as well, you know? Uh, with, you know, with religion, because a lot of black Native Americans that go into prison you know, are, <clears throat> are either coerced into, uh, what, Christianity, or, um, Rastafarianism, or Islam, you know, some type of, some type of religion, you know, to keep you away from, uh, you know, your true heritage, which are, you know, Hebrew Israelites, you know, the, the, the more time you spend in jail, the less, the less time that you have to figure out who you truly are, you know. So this is a, uh, article from Huffington Post. The school to prison pipeline is institutional racism. So what is the school to prison pipeline? The school to prison pipeline is a no-nonsense trend in American education where children are directed straight from the classroom and into bureaucratic clutches of the criminal justice system. The phenomenon manifests itself in disciplinary practices and zero-tolerance policies that criminalize unruly behavior and minor infractions such as truancy, graffiti, or violating a school dress code. Not only that, it involves the presence of security guards and police on campus, breaking up trivial playground fights with a billy club and a taser, you know? So they actually, and I've had police, <laughs> we had policemen in our, in our high school, man. And the, the minute I got to, the, you know, got to ninth grade and I seen, started seeing the police in the high school, um, they're meant to intimidate, they're there to intimidate the blacks and the Latins, you know, and the Native Americans. You know, and to protect the uh, the white and Asians, you know, the white students, you know, any nationality that's not black, land, and Native American that doesn't have that stigma of a of a of a young monster, I want to say, or or uh, or a super predator, they protect, you know. 
It says, gone are the days of blackboard jungle when you could give your paper tiger of a schoolmaster some, del some delinquent lip and get away with it. These days, interrupting teacher during class might get you prepper sprayed and hauled off to jail in full restraints to face the full wrath of the juvenile justice system. And that's true, because I've actually seen that happen. I've seen, um, I've seen people get hauled off by security guards in class, and you don't see them till the next school year because they've been in jail. They have a misdemeanor for, for uh, for disrupting class, you know. Well, that's totally out of control. That only happens to the blacks that are Native Americans, uh, by design due to the, to the uh, conditions that they've grown up in, you know, due to the condition that they live in, you know. Due to the non-examples that they don't see every day, you know, the no men in the household, the no, the broken families, the, the uh, having no no money, you know. It says whatever happened to the attention after school, it got farmed out to the cops. Unbelievable. No sports fans, only in America. Where did these zero tolerance policies or zero cents come from? Fear of Columbine style massacres ushered in the modern era of paranoia and punishment in the classroom. Now the open halls of education lead to the closed doors and barred grills of the prison cell. School has become a police state and a hallway, it's like in a halfway house to jail. It is a great act of violence committed against youths by adults. Little surprise that many kids caught in the school to prison pipeline come from low-income families, have learning disabilities, or histories of abuse and neglect. Indeed, they are the ones who might benefit from well-rounded education, right? And these are mostly black, flags and Native American households, man. You know, especially the ones that have learning disabilities. Because we are the ones that that uh, are basically are being poisoned above everyone else. So we're born with those learning disabilities, you know, um, due to, like I said, due to certain social uh, engineering, man. Like the crack, epi ah, like the crack epidemic of the 1980s, you know, uh, heroin cocaine, you know, even marijuana, you know, that so-called war on drugs that was created by, uh, by, um, you know, Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon, and those drugs are being flown from the CIA from Brazil into our neighborhoods to give us that, uh, to give us that, you know, that, um, that low income, that illusion, that, that, um, disadvantage, you know, over the other, under the other, that disadvantage of under the other nations, you know, if I'm saying that correctly. To give the other nations the advantage over us, Slovakia, you know. So, and it says histories of abuse and neglect. That could be drug abuse, you know. That could be um, that could be uh, any type of mental abuse, you know. Uh, being raped, you know, seeing murders happen before your eyes, things like that, man, you know. Which is also also a uh, a fact of you know those drugs, the gangs, things of that nature, that are all created by Esau. It says indeed they are the are alienated, excluded. Instead, it's like instead they are alienated, excluded, criminalized, and written off by society. So what exactly is a school to prison pipeline? Simple. It's just another term for institutional racism and incarcerating disadvantaged African American school children instead of educating them. It's happening right now. Every day in every town and city in America, and yet there is no ab an absence of public outrage. Remember because there's a media blackout, man. There are things being reported, you know, such as articles, such as certain doc documentaries, but no one cares, man. Because the fact of the matter is, us blacks and Native Americans are under a curse, man. Us Israelites are under a curse by Yahweh Bashem Shai. And we're not going to get under that curse until we come back to the law, statutes, and commandments. Other than that, the whole world is going to pound on, on us and pound on us and pound on us until the Lord comes back to destroy them. Plain and simple. It says Jim Crow in the classrooms of 21st century America. <laughs> Surely not. Yes, unfortunately, young black kids, males especially, have always been a threat of punishment by unhinged authority figures afraid of school violence. The figures are shocking. And racial disproportionality in the school to prison pipeline is a black and white fact. But black, wh white, or whatever, it's an aberrant policy and practice to criminalize children and pollute the future waters of society. You know, let's see. Oh, like I said, I want to go down a couple paragraphs because, um, like I said earlier, 
You know, you you are to be traded on the stock market. You know, and actually be profited from. Like they have something called convict leasing. You know, which is basically has been an act since before the Jim Crow laws. It's actually um, a law that was in effect that went into effect after slavery. You know, the post slavery laws. Um, and what that is basically is you know you're sent to prison, you know, for a, a petty crime, and then you're leased out or contracted out to certain businesses, and you're basically forced to work for free, you know, and you're, you're basically forced to work all, you know, long hours of the day, just like you're in slavery, so actually slavery never left, and that Jim Crow, or that, uh, and that convict leasing is still elevant, still evident today in uh, most of your prison systems, you know, and it's a funny, and there's a movie you can watch, it's hilarious, you know, it, it, it actually is a funny movie, um, but they made a joke out of it. But it's really not a joke. And the movie's called Life with uh, Eddie Murphy and and uh, Martin Lawrence. You know, it has Bernie Mac and a couple guys in it. But, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very funny movie, but it's about convict leasing in the 1920s. You know? And how basically they're throwing us back into slavery. And they give you life sentences on purpose so that you can never get out of, get out of prison. You know, so that you can continue to, to uh, help the industrial prison complex, you know? That's why black flags and Native Americans get more time for uh, for the crimes than you know than whites in other nations, you know, because they're slowing us, they're throwing us back into that slavery. It says every year the U.S. spends ten ten thousand five hundred dollars per child on education, and eighty eight thousand on each child incarcerated. So it's actually cheaper to throw you in prison. I mean, slack it. I mean, it's actually uh, cheaper to educate you, but they spend more money on you in prison and they get more return on investment. 66% of children who have been incarcerated never return to school. The U.S. incarcerates five times more children than any other nation state in the world. Right. Because it costs more to incarcerate you. So they're going to get all that money back, you know, and they're going to get every penny and every cent out of you they can says the U.S. incarcerates five times more children than any other nation state in the world. Is this the best that America can offer the child in the 21st century? And, you know, then the rest of the article goes into re trying to reform, talking about reforming schools and things like that. But basically, man, they're using this uh, institutionalized racism, you know, basically with racism in disguise, to basically use it as another method to keep our, to keep our nation in subjection, you know? And it's a part of the curse, man. And this this whole prison uh, pipeline, or this whole prison complex that's made up of the black slides of Native Americans is actually a curse. This is Isaiah 42, verse 22. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. Robbed of what? Robbed of their nationality. Robbed of knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Robbed of their God, you know? And spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, you know, traps. You know? In such trap. Are the uh like one trap we just got to going over is the United States education system that is a trap, you know, to keep us disillusioned, and uh, and uh you know stupid. And they are hid in prison houses, you know, and not only are they hid in prison houses as in uh, actual, actual uh prisons, but they are hidden prisons for their minds, man, because they're hidden they're snared in the, in the holes, which are the traps. Which is the educational system, you know, because they are robbed and spoiled, you know, robbed of their nationality and who they truly are. So of course they're going to be in prison houses. They're going to be thrown in, thrown in the prisons, and they're going to be in prisons for their minds, man. They are for a prey, and none delivered, right? Because they get thrown right back into slavery, man. They're fed on, you know, and other nations are feeding on us like leeches, for a spoil, and none saith restore. So there's no one that's going to say restore, man. Until you have Bashim Al Shai comes back. So, you know, Al Sharpton and all these other so called black leaders, man, they can't save us. You know, the next president of the United States can't save us. You know, only how Bashim Al Shai can save us from this turmoil that we are in. You know, and because of that, Yahweh Bashim Al Shai is going to destroy Esau. You know, this is Zechariah chapter 1, verse 15. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. You know, for I was but a little displeased. But they helped forward the affliction, you know, and this institutionalized racism, you know, this right here, 
and you know the school to prison complex this is part of them uh affording the affliction man you know because they took us from from chattel slavery to mental slavery back to chattel slavery that's a hell of a cycle man you know so with that i just wanted to shed some light on the institutionalized racism you know in the education system uh you know in the belly of the beast so with that i want to give call hello yahweh by shemel shai the bonds of the apostles and the elders of great millstone and the well salutation to the brethren on the four corners of the earth push the word of truth and sincerity shalom